In a quiet fields of Delaware, Ohio, there once stood a strange-looking structure. It didn't look like a telescope. There was no dome, no glass, no scientist peering through a lens. Instead, it looked like a massive metal ear pointed at the sky. This was the big ear radio telescope, built not to see space, but to listen to it. It was part of a growing effort called SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. The idea was simple. If someone out there was trying to talk, maybe we could hear them. By 1977, the Cold War was still in the background, but space exploration had captured the spotlight. NASA had wrapped up the Apollo missions. Voyager 1 and 2 were almost ready for launch. And scientists had begun asking a question, once considered far-fetched. What if we are not alone? Big Ear wasn't like most observatories. It couldn't move or turn. It just sat in one place and let the rotation of the Earth bring different parts of the sky into view. As the planet spun, Big Ear slowly swept over the stars, one narrow slice at a time. Each night it gathered radio signals from space. A computer recorded the strengths of those signals using numbers and letters. Low values meant noise, higher ones meant something stronger. The data came out as long paper printouts, row after row of characters. That's where Jerry Ehman came in. He was a volunteer astronomer at Ohio State University, one of the few people trained to read those codes. His job was to scan the printouts, looking for anything that didn't belong. Something strange, something structured. On August 15, 1977, the telescope did what it always did. It listened. The next day, the data looked ordinary. But three days later, Jerry sat down with a fresh stack of printouts. Most of it looked normal. Until he saw something he'd never seen before. A short line of six characters jumped off the page. 6EQUJ5. Jerry paused. The signal was strong. It rose, peaked and faded, just like a real source passing through the telescope's view. He grabbed a red pen, circled the line and wrote one word beside it. Wow! That note would become the name of the signal and the beginning of one of the biggest mysteries in modern astronomy. Hello? We need to talk. Jerry Ehman had seen a lot of data over the years, endless sheets of numbers, letters, most of it nothing more than background noise from space. But this one was completely different. The telescope's computer used a simple system to show how strong a radio signal was. Numbers went from 1 to 9. After that came letters, starting with A. The higher the character, the stronger the signal. U was near the top. This signal started low, climbed to U, then dropped off, a smooth rise and fall. That shape wasn't just unusual, it was exactly what astronomers expected. Later, they traced the signal to the constellation Sagittarius, a dense region of stars near the center of our galaxy. But it was a frequency that got scientists talking, 1420 MHz. That number matches a special frequency given off by hydrogen atoms, the most common element in the universe. It's known as the hydrogen line and it's quiet, meaning not much natural interference. For that reason, it's been suggested as a good place to listen for signals from intelligent life. In other words, if someone out there was trying to say hello, this is exactly where they might choose to speak. And that's what Big Ear had heard. Jerry and his team pointed Big Ear back to the same spot. Nothing. Other telescopes tried. Still nothing. The signal never returned. Jerry didn't rush to conclusions. He wanted to believe, but he stayed cautious. I wish I could say it was something extraterrestrial, but we don't have the evidence, he later said. And that was the problem. In science, one clear signal isn't enough. You need to observe it again. But this signal, whatever it was, came only once, and it hasn't been seen since. After the shock wore off, the real work began. Jerry Ehman and his team did what any careful scientist would do. They started rolling things out. First, they checked the equipment. Maybe there was a glitch, but everything looked fine. The telescope had been running smoothly that night. No signs of malfunction, no power issues, no computer errors. Next, they considered man-made sources. Could it have been a satellite? There were plenty in orbit by 1970s, but satellites moved quickly across the sky. 
If one had passed through the telescope's view, the signal would have lasted just a few seconds, not 72. What about a signal bouncing off something, like a plane or space debris? That can happen, but bounce signals are usually messy. They come in distorted, not clean and smooth like this one. Then come natural objects, pulsars, quasars or distant stars with unusual emissions. But none of those produce narrow band signals like the wild signal, especially not right on the hydrogen line. Nature doesn't usually send such focused messages. Years later, a new idea appeared. In 2017, a researcher named Antonio Perez suggested the signal might have come from a comet, one that hadn't been discovered back in 1977. Comets can emit radio waves, and this one, called 266P Christensen, had passed through the right part of the sky. It sounded promising, but when scientists tested it, the theory fell apart. The signal was way too strong for a comet, and comets usually give off broad, scattered signals, not the sharp spike Big Ear had captured, so that idea faded too. Some thought it could have been a military test, maybe even something classified. Others believed it was a deep space object doing something we didn't understand. And a few wonders if it was intentional. A short one-time message, like a beacon sent into the dark. The biggest problem wasn't just a mystery, it was the signal never repeated. If it had a source, a planet, a star, even a moving craft, it should have passed by again. But after dozens of follow-up scans, nothing ever came back. As the years passed, Jerry Ehman became more skeptical. People kept asking if he believed it was a sign of alien life. His answer stayed the same. We should keep looking, but one signal is not enough. And so the wow signal stayed what it had always been, a one-time event. In 1998, the Big Ear Telescope was dismantled, the land was sold, but the signal left a mark that didn't fade. It captured attention far beyond science circles. News outlets reported it, documentaries followed. One of the most meaningful tributes came from Carl Sagan, who had long supported SETI and believed that intelligent civilizations, if they wanted to communicate, would likely use narrowband radio signals, just like the WOW signal. His novel Contact published in 1985, tells the story of a scientist who received a signal from a distant star. Back in the real world, SETI continued to grow. More countries joined, new telescopes came online. One of the biggest breakthroughs came in 2015, when the Breakthrough Listen initiative was launched. Founded by physicist Stephen Hawking and entrepreneur Yuri Milner, it became the largest search for extraterrestrial life ever attempted. Breakthrough Listen uses powerful telescopes in West Virginia, Australia, and other parts of the world to scan the skies around the clock. Billions of radio frequencies, thousands of stars. And now, with artificial intelligence, scientists can scan and filter incoming data in real time. China also joined the effort with FAST, the largest and most sensitive radio telescope on Earth. It can detect faint signals from galaxies billions of light years away. And like the others, it had also spent time listening on the hydrogen frequency, the same place the WOW signal was found. But no signals like it has appeared again. What if that was it? What if for the first time in human history we received a message and didn't realize it? There was nothing to decode, no language, no code, just a tone like a ping. If it was sent by intelligent life, it wasn't a conversation, it was a signal in the dark, a single knock, and maybe we missed our chance to respond. Our galaxy alone is about 100,000 light years across. And even with today's technology, our radio telescopes only listen to tiny slice of the sky at any given moment. We also monitor just a narrow range of radio frequencies, like tuning in a few stations on a massive cosmic radio. That's what makes catching something like the WOW signal so rare. It's like dipping a cup into the ocean and hoping to scoop up a fish at just the right time in just the right place. And yet somehow we might have done exactly that. Some scientists believe the signal could have been a beacon, a simple broadcast sent in all directions, not aimed specifically at us, but meant to be noticed by anyone who happened to be listening, like a lighthouse shining across the sea. If that's true, Earth may have rotated into the path of that signal for just over a minute. Then it passed, and we never heard it again. What's unsettling isn't just the silence that followed, it's the thought that we were almost ready, but not quite. The signal came, it was noticed, but we couldn't trace it, repeat it, 
or explain it. And that might be the most human part of the story. Because it reminds us how fragile discovery can be, how easily a clue can be missed, how a historic moment can come and go while we are still figuring out how to listen. The wow signal wasn't just a mystery, it was a moment that brought new weight of questions scientists had been asking for decades. Many of those questions connect back to something called the Drake Equation, a formula that tries to estimate how many intelligent civilizations might exist in our galaxy. It considers how many stars have planets, how often life might emerge, and how long advanced civilizations might send out signals before going silent. The equation doesn't give a definite number, but even with cautious estimates, it rarely points to zero. The wow signal didn't solve the equation, but it gave us a reason to think that someone else might be out there. And yet, the closer scientists looked, the more questions it raised. One detail stood out. There was no Doppler shift. That might sound technical, but the idea is simple. It's the apparent change in the frequency of a wave caused by relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. When something in space moves toward us, its radio waves get squeezed, the frequency shifts higher. When it moves away, the waves stretch and the frequency drops. It's like a changing pitch of a siren as an ambulance drives past. That shift, called the Doppler effect, helps scientists tell if an object is moving and in which direction. But the wow signal didn't shift at all. Its frequency stayed stable. That's strange. It could mean the source wasn't moving relative to Earth. Or it could mean the signal was tightly controlled, aimed in such a way that the motion was cancelled out. Either way, it didn't behave like a random object in space. That doesn't prove anything. But it doesn't fit anything we know either. Some scientists, including Stephen Hawking, warned against sending signals into space too soon. He compared it to shouting into a dark jungle. You don't know who is listening. You don't know what they want. And once they hear you, you can't take it back. Maybe listening is safer than speaking. Maybe silence is caution. Or maybe that one signal, brief, unexplained, wasn't just a test of our technology, maybe it was a test of our wisdom. And if it really was someone calling, the real question isn't whether we heard it, it's what we'll choose to say next.